Who am I? That's the question we've been dealing with in our June worship series. And if you've been uh, along with us throughout this whole series, whether here on campus or, or online, you know that first we focused on how the unholy trinity, the devil and the world as it stands against Christ and his church and our sinful human nature, try to get us to look for our identity in all the wrong places. Then after that, we started to focus on how the Holy Trinity, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, help us to find our true identity in God and what he has done for us and for our salvation. First, we focused on how God the Father, before the creation of the world, chose us and predestined us to be adopted as his children. Last weekend, we looked at how God the Son, through his death on the cross, redeemed us through his blood so that he could buy us back from our slavery to sin and death and the power of the devil. Today, we're going to focus on, as Rev said, how the Holy Spirit seals the deal by connecting us personally to Christ's redeeming work so that our adoption and our eternal inheritance are guaranteed. So we're going to go back to that first reading in Ephesians chapter 1 to kind of set the tone then for the message. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who's a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. First of all, it says you were included in Christ. And what we're going to do today is we're going to look at a couple of different ways the Holy Spirit includes us and connects us to Christ's saving work. But first, I want to have us look at the verse that follows that talks about some of the other things the Holy Spirit is up to here. Notice it says, you were marked in him, in Christ, with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. The seal means that we're marked as God's possession. We belong to him. Not only that, the Holy Spirit is our seal, which means that the Holy Spirit is a deposit, a deposit guaranteeing our eternal inheritance. And that deposit is good all the way until our redemption. And we'll talk in just a little bit about what that means as well. So let's go back now to what it says about the Holy Spirit including us in Christ's saving work. Notice it says, when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, you were included in Christ. When you believed. One way is to hear and to believe the good news of his salvation. And that belief in Jesus is a gift that the Holy Spirit grants us. St. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit gives us that gift. In other words, once a person recognizes or accepts the reality that Jesus is their Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit has already done the saving work. Now, some might say, but wait, don't I have to figure this stuff out first and then at some point choose or decide that Jesus is going to be my Savior? Well, Jesus reminds us, you did not choose me. I chose you. Our faith is a gift from our good and gracious God. One of the most powerful and uh, memorable uh, reminders to me of that truth, that faith in itself is a gift, came um, after I left my first career and went back to college. I was working uh, part-time for Bethesda Lutheran Group Homes. So it's a residential home for mentally handicapped adults. And part of my work with the residents included helping them learn basic life skills so someday they could live independently. So they would learn things like how to prep and cook and clean up after a meal. Uh, they'd learn how to count money and give change. They'd learn how to make a list and then go shopping for groceries. And they'd learn how to clean the house and also how to do laundry. And all of these things were challenges for them. But one thing that was never a challenge for them was talking about Jesus. Whenever we'd, we would gather for the Bible study in the evening, it was amazing how these individuals who struggled so much with basic life skills could just come alive as they talked about their faith in Jesus and as they talked about their knowledge of the Bible. It was an amazing thing to see. But how is that possible? How could these same people who struggled to mentally grasp basic life skills have such a grasp of their faith and their knowledge of the Bible? Well, it's because faith doesn't depend 
upon our IQ. It doesn't depend upon our intellectual ability. Faith depends on the Holy Spirit's gifting. And that gift of faith in the gospel is what the Holy Spirit gives us so we can be personally united, connected with Christ and his saving work. So that's one of the ways that the Holy Spirit does it. Another way is through the waters of baptism. In Romans chapter 6, verse 4 and 5, it says, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. So in baptism, the benefits of Christ's death and resurrection are applied to you and me personally. In baptism, we're buried with Christ and then we're raised to a new life in him. I'm sure many of you have noticed that when one of the pastors does a baptism here, whether it's a baby or a child or youth or adult, we do the sign of the cross on their forehead and on their heart to mark them as one redeemed by Christ the crucified. Well, that mark is a seal because baptism seals the deal. And that's what that's symbolizing is that in baptism, the Holy Spirit seals the deal of our salvation. Now, let's go to the next reading that uh, Rev shared. Now it is God who makes both you and us stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. So the scriptures remind us that God the Father set his seal of ownership on us by putting the spirit in us. So we have a constant companion, a constant counselor, a constant comforter helping us navigate this crazy life in this world all the way to our heavenly home. The Holy Spirit is the guarantee that deposit that guarantees our eternal inheritance. I've heard some of you talk about the fact that you've been working on refinancing your homes, trying to take advantage of the lower interest rates right now. And you've talked about that period of waiting and wondering and worrying what mortgage rate you're going to get locked in and guaranteed. Well, thanks to the Holy Spirit, you don't have to worry and wait and wonder when your salvation is going to get locked in and guaranteed. When the Holy Spirit brought you to faith in Jesus, that is when he sealed the deal. That is when you got locked in and guaranteed of your eternal inheritance. And the best news of all is that inheritance is free and clear. No down payment, no mortgage payments, because Christ has paid it all in full for you when he redeemed you on the cross. Speaking of redemption, listen to what Jesus says about the end of the world in Luke 21. He says, at that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Now, this might sound kind of confusing because last weekend, we talked about how Christ's death on the cross was our redemption. So what's this talk now about our redemption being at the end of the world? It's kind of confusing, isn't it? Well, let me confuse you a little more. Let's look at Romans chapter 8. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. The first fruits of the Spirit, same thing as being sealed by the Spirit. It's that guarantee of our eternal inheritance. No problem there. But Paul talks here in Romans about waiting for our adoption. Didn't God the Father choose us and predestine us to be adopted as his children before the beginning of creation? And didn't Jesus pay for our adoption when he redeemed us on the cross? Why now this talk about a future adoption and a future redemption? Why is Paul connecting adoption with the redemption of our bodies? Well, a way to look at this is like this. In Ephesians, Paul talks about Christ giving up his body on the cross so we could be redeemed through his blood. In Romans, Paul talks about us giving up our bodies on the last day so that they can be redeemed to be like his glorious body. It's an amazing trade, isn't it? How many of you look forward to when you can uh, trade in this earthly humble body for a glorious eternal body? I know I do. We've got a lot to look forward to when this life ends. And yet we live in a world that thinks this life is all there is and that living for yourself in this life is all there is. 
This world's view of life is this. You're born, you grow, you thrive, you age, you wear out, you die. That's it. And if that's the case, live for yourself because this life is all there is. Seems like over the last few months, we've seen a lot of that, haven't we? People living as if this life is all there is and just living for themselves. But from God's perspective, there's so much more for us to live for, and there's so much more than just living for ourselves in this life. St. Paul writes in, in uh, Philippians chapter 3, He will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory. We get to look forward to redeeming our humble earthly bodies for a glorious heavenly body like Christ's. Until that day comes, as Christians, we're living in the now and the not yet. I know it's kind of hard to see this diagram, but it, it shows how living in the present age until the coming of Christ, we're living in this period between Christ's death and resurrection and ascension and when Christ comes again. So these two ages exist together as what we'll call the now and the not yet. And this is how it works. God the Father chose us and predestined us for adoption before the creation of the world. But our adoption won't be fully realized until we move into our heavenly home. On the cross, God the Son redeemed us through his blood to forgive our sins and buy us back from our slavery to sin and death and the power of the devil. But our redemption won't be fully realized until we trade in our humble earthly bodies for glorious heavenly bodies. Through faith, God the Holy Spirit united us to Christ's saving work and became that deposit guaranteeing our eternal inheritance. But while eternal life has begun for us when the Holy Spirit brought us to faith in Christ, it won't be fully realized till we see Jesus face to face in glory. So we live in the now and the not yet. And that's okay because we know who we are, we know whose we are, and we know where we're going. My open prayer is that through this sermon series in this month of June, we've come to a point where we have been given assurance by God's word of who we are. We are adopted by God the Father. We're redeemed by Jesus Christ. We're sealed by the Holy Spirit. That gives ultimate real meaning to who we are. That's what gives us our lasting identity. And my hope and prayer too is that because God has placed his seal of ownership and approval on us through the Holy Spirit, we can say to God, here I am, signed, sealed, and delivered. I'm yours. Amen.